Buying a house is the biggest financial decision most of us will ever make. But we often fall in love with our homes for all the wrong reasons. Then spend a lifetime and every spare penny we have trying to fix them. OK, Renaissance is back. We go up. Oh, my day. We go out. It's massive. And we go under. It is opulence on the highest level. Ah, 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 stop, 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 stop. Oh, this is too big. Most people are chasing the eternal dream of more space. I feel like I'm losing control of the project. But for some, building an extension provides an opportunity to unleash their inner architect. I don't know how we're sticking within budget. We're not sticking within budget. The unknowns are massive. To create radical... Hello, everybody in the house! <laughs> ambitious... It's sharp, it's bold, unapologetic architecture. And sometimes, life-changing builds. I've never seen an extension like that in my life, ever. £28 million. Pounds. Mic drop! Boom! I've been in the property game since I was 22, as both a developer and designer. I'm fascinated by the individual choices people make about their homes. In just three months of 2020, we applied to extend our homes by over 16 million square feet for the chance to reimagine existing layouts and create dynamic new living spaces. Tonight, we're following the transformation of a Victorian building into an energy-efficient dream. Or nightmare. I'm tight on money, so I've got to get it bloody right. <laughs> I'll also be looking at the key materials we're using in new and classic extension builds. As we make our homes larger, cooler and more beautiful, with increasingly ingenious schemes. Now more than ever, it's important to go green. There are a multitude of ways that you can make your property that bit more eco-friendly. But this couple I'm about to meet are making history and taking things to the extreme with their not one, not two, but three extensions. Six years ago, architect Richard and his writer wife Eva made the exciting decision to convert this 19th century ex-workshop and timber yard in South London from his office into a family home for themselves and their two children. When I first saw this building, it was um, Richard's office space. Again, it looked very much like an office. They've spent the last 20 months getting the bare bones of the structure complete with three extensions. Now, they're working hard to turn it into a passive house. Come on, guys, you know what a passive house is, right? Tell him, Richard. A passive house is a comfortable building that uses very little energy. Thank you. And now for the technical bit. If you build a passive house, you're building a house which is between 18 and 20, say, 22 degrees internally, and you're not going to get drafts, you're not going to get cold spots in the house. The idea is that the house is comfortable. You end up also having fresh air, which is filtered in. Um, so there's loads of benefits for health. The principles about how to do this are um, quite technical. I mean, it's a huge spreadsheet. Basically, a highly insulated, eco-friendly house with rigorous efficiency standards that maintains a constant temperature and uses a mind-blowing 90% less energy than a normal house. Got it? As well as converting the main building, Richard and Eva are also extending big time. We've extended down into the basement, we've extended out uh, with the kitchen area, and we've extended up by putting um, another floor on the top. But creating this innovative and unique extension is not going to be fast. If you want something special, 
we have to put the hard work in and, and wait for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. As well as being a clever bit of design, it just so happens that this passive house is also one of the first of its kind in the UK. They're converting a commercial building into a residential space. Hey, Richard and Eva, how are you guys? Hi, we're, we're good. We're doing pretty well. So um, we're currently in a timber yard. From my understanding, prior to this, you were literally living like, what, 10 yards away? Yes, just, that's right. Just yeah. over there. Yeah. Convenient. <laughs> just yeah, pick yeah. up all the suitcases and just <laughs> do it all yourself. You don't need the man in the van, nothing like that. No removal. Eva, are you a fan of the passive house concept? I'm a fan in terms of the environment. There's a very technical side to passive house, which I'm not really a fan of. I can see Richard's face. He can't hold it. He's trying his best. He's like, this is my favourite stuff. I live for this. Slightly at times. <laughs> There's a little tear just oh, running God. down, running down his eye, breaking his heart, man. Tell me about the three extensions. So we've managed to add a whole other floor on the roof in the barrel vault. And that was limited mm -hmm. because um, of the heights of the surrounding buildings, so we had to keep it quite low. We built the extension out towards the front because we haven't got a, uh, there is no back. There's only a front garden. Richard and Eva are taking a 19th century building and making it fit for purpose for a growing 21st century family by adding three extensions. The new basement will house a TV room, gym, spare bedroom, and a bike store. At ground level, a new front extension will contain a large open plan kitchen, dining area and living room, and will also give the home a new entrance. At the top, a new vaulted loft space will be home to an open plan master bedroom suite with walk-in wardrobe, a writing studio for Eva and a sun terrace. What's, what's this area going to be here? This is going to be the kitchen over nice. here with a dining area over there, overlooking our new garden. And the bit back there is really the living area. Really nice. So it's going to be big. It's got this sort of industrial feel as well. But if you're going for industrial, what, what, what are you thinking to put in there? It was uh, really chosen by Eva. It's sort of this, like rusty metal. Yeah. It's like a, a Cortan steel. So lots of kind of those earthy, kind of natural surfaces, especially in this part of the house. Sounds good, but the really interesting thing about this kitchen is it can be put away when not in use. I was really um, wanting that we could close the kitchen down once we're not using it. We've got folding pocket doors yeah. which go into the sides of each of cupboards. Yeah, I've seen And those. so then what happens is you can close this whole wall off and therefore it just looks really seamless, nice. Seamless, like a yeah, seamless, seamless wall. exactly. You, even, you know, the ovens are hidden behind it. Everything's hidden. So all you would see is, is just this wall. And have it just as a nice, simple space. I'm all for quiet, simple spaces. This really is an exciting and innovative design. But the house is not entirely straying away from tradition. They're using an old material in the most modern way. Here, Richard and Eva are using lime render. Because they're trying to achieve an airtight house, this allows all the moisture to escape. If they used regular plaster, they'd be left with interstitial condensation. You don't want that. And as if the worry about interstitial condensation isn't enough, the airtight passive house plans have taken a weird and very expensive feline turn. So, yeah, we have, um, we have a cat. When we started this build, we didn't have a cat. So we've had to think about Opal. And, yeah, we've had to build a cat flat, but it's going to be a passive house friendly cat flat. cat flat. And how do you do that, then? If you know about the space station, it's like that. Basically, it's an airlock. It costs a grand. Yeah, <laughs> it's a grand for a cat flat. Wow. <laughs> Opal's very, very lucky. Most of the major structural work has been done. Before the rooms are fitted out, this is the perfect opportunity to check them out. Oh, my days. Look at the ceiling. So what, this floor wasn't here before, was it? No, it wasn't here at all. Wow. So this is all new. Richard and Eva designed this curved barrel vaulted ceiling to create as much space as possible, 
without wildly impacting the exterior. Basically, we added the entire floor. So it's not just a loft conversion, it's a whole new floor. All right, so tell me about the room, guys. What is this room going to be used for? Uh, so this room essentially is a study. I, during the day, can come and work. Um, really important to have the light flooding in and quite an airy space. So from what it looks like, a lot of the structure's already been done. When is the exact completion date? We're, we're not far off. Yeah, yeah, we're talking in the next two or three months. OK, you know? two or three months. Yeah, that's, we should be finished by then. I am really impressed by Richard and Eva. Like, if you just see Richard's enthusiasm and passion throughout the whole thing, it's clear this has been something he's dreamt about for so long, and all his dreams are coming to reality. Now, the challenge is to transform what's currently a building site into an incredible family home on a pretty tight schedule. I can't wait to see how it all looks when it's finished. There is a pervasive belief in the UK that good design, architects and lawyers are only for the rich. Or as my mum believes, people with too much money. By extensions can be a tiny way of dipping your foot into the world of architecture that doesn't always have to break the bank. If you're a fledgling architect, winning a bid to design a whole structure is a bit of a long shot. In the meantime, an extension is a great way of showcasing your creative skills. You can go massive or tiny and still make it bold. This ingenious double extension is a modest 140 square foot that's perfectly formed. Formerly a small one bedroom flat in the Crouch End conservation area, the home offered little room for manoeuvre when the owners found out they were expecting a baby. The small side garden with its skewed boundary fences offered the only room for expansion. Two extensions break out from the existing bedroom, responding to and limited by the angles of the fences. By doing this, they formed an extra bedroom, which is a triumph in ingenuity. In a potentially darker corner, the roof breaks out by being prized open and folded back, allowing the daylight in. A piece of design genius, this build is also a victory for thrift. It costs far less than the cost of moving, including stamp duty, and it received the Don't Move Improve Award for the best value build, an all-round win. Especially in inner cities, space is at a premium and extensions are often a pipe dream. But this tiny 38 square foot downstairs shower was the dream of a homeowner in South East London who's cleverly utilised some extra space out of side access. The beautiful steel structure, powder coated in two shades of pink, sits on a bed of bespoke terrazzo with a central glaze panel that wraps around to create a skylight, giving shower time a whole new angle, a really small one. But at the other end of the spectrum, an extension can provide the opportunity to do something on a massive scale without building a house from scratch, which can be harder because you have to respect what's already there. This extension is more than twice the size of the original house. Due to the sheer scale of this 2,600 square foot extension, the aim here was to create a structure that was new, modern and bold, to contrast with the original farmer's cottage, for the two to sit comfortably together. Pleasing the modernists and the traditionalists is not the easiest of briefs. To achieve this, the extension is designed using the form and the proportions of the Victorian farm cottage. It's split into two equally sized spaces with a double height glazed area in between so it doesn't dramatically dominate the cottage. Making the place eco-friendly was high on the agenda for the homeowners, so the extension is formed out of a lightweight timber frame 
on top of concrete foundations made from a partially recycled cement mix. For a contemporary twist, the low exterior walls are clad in this light grey cement board and frame panels of Nat Flynn are used as a modern nod to the traditional building materials used in the Chiltern Hills. It's all about the texture. Above, thin vertical strips of Siberian larch have been finished with a pre-weathered solution to create this pale grey colour and fit with the muted palette. The shape of the eaves is mirrored in the extension and a new sleek wing-shaped recycled aluminium roof takes inspiration from the traditional hip slate roof on the cottage. Inside, it's all about the shape and texture. The open tread staircase casts shadows throughout the day and is covered in cork for warmth and noise insulation. Hello! Yeah, it works. The geometric tiles inject playfulness. Gives me Art Deco sort of vibes. And the custom-made curved table and benches bring a soft quality to the kitchen. Really, really nice. Oh, a bit of quartz. Looks like one of those easy wipe situations. My spider senses are telling me that there's a hidden door somewhere. And I think it might be this one. Hey! Follow me, guys, follow me. It's the utility room, FYI. Upstairs, the shapes continue. The floor plan of the rooms is simple, but look towards the ceiling and the contours of the winged roof come into play. And like all smart architecture, interior spaces wouldn't be complete without some bespoke storage. This extension might be an epic structure, but it's the dimensions and tricks and materials that complement the cottage. It's sort of like saying, that's nice, we respect that. Here's a new version of it. Over in South London, Richard and Eva are going state of the art with their three extensions on a former 19th century workshop. This is one of the first commercial to residential conversions in the UK that has been turned into a passive house. And I'm about to get technical. All right, so literally this is the plant room, guys. And when it comes to a passive house, this is the heartbeat. You cannot make a passive house without having one of these or one of these. A passive house system can be applied to any building and cut your energy bills by 90%. It's basically a thermos flask. It works as a totally airtight container with a brilliant ventilation system. Fresh air goes in and is heated by the warmth already in the house. This way, the building is at a constant temperature. It's epic. For Richard to move into his innovative house, it's all systems go, as he's hoping to have it ready by Eva's birthday at the end of July. It's, it's quite a busy site at the moment, so, and I'm just trying to get it finished. Well, I have to get it finished. I promise my wife will be in by the summer. I hope so. Double agent life of husband and architect is proving tricky for our noble friend. Eva's very much like a client, and I have to discuss things uh, very much like I would do with a client when I discuss it with Eva or the kids. I remind myself that um, this is our family house and it's very important to treat it as such. Yeah, there is a hell of a lot of pressure. One of Richard's great qualities is his scientific precision. We are very particular with detail. Everything on this job is drawn to the millimetre. We've just got to get it right, that's all. So, currently, the staircase is slightly over, too much over onto the corridor side. And we've had on our drawings that we wanted a 900 mil gap. We have to move them because we're going to struggle getting furniture into these back rooms. 
At the moment, it's slightly under, so the staircase needs to be shifted over, and it, it is taking a little bit of time. And we've got to get some guys in to unscrew and unbolt it and shift this over. We're talking about a little bit less than an inch, so we're just having to shift the staircase over about 20 mil. Such precision, though, costs time and moolah. Being an architect, I don't want to rush it. The extra expense of doing it right is more important than to try and um, save the extra money on the interest. And I'm tight on money, so I've got to get it bloody right. <laughs> but with looming costs in materials, this is an ideal for Richard's budget. Timber supply is a nightmare, but it's gone up in price. It's not it, everything. You can get hold of everything, but you have to pay a premium. And like many pioneers before him, Richard needs to take an uncomfortable step and move in before the rest of the family. There is quite a lot of pressure to finish it and make it habitable. Once it's habitable, the mortgage company is happy. Financially, um, I've got to convert this into a mortgage. Uh, at the moment, I've got a loan on here. The bank have been good to me, but um, I've, delayed, um, I've delayed converting it back to a mortgage. So that's just something I need to do. So, the price of materials is sky high. He's desperately trying to keep the bank happy. And he's told his wife she should be in in a month. This was probably the hardest project I've done in my lifetime so far. Um, even though I've worked in Hong Kong, I've worked in Mumbai, skyscrapers, all sorts of things, this has been one of the hardest ones. Pressure, yeah, there is pressure. But nothing that a cup of tea won't stop. <laughs> Good man. So the latest architectural trend is for sustainable schemes and building materials. There's now a plethora of buildings that hit the sweet spot. Environmentally friendly and stunningly beautiful. This camouflage house on the Isle of Man uses the natural stones to blend into the landscape. It might be a really bougie way of saying, I don't like visitors, so I'm hiding, but it's a great ecological use of what's around you. Building materials I find sexy. Glass, wood, concrete, oh yeah. Things I find not so sexy, rubber. But I'm about to have my mind changed. Rubber is a newish contender as a cladding material and is an amazing insulator. Aesthetically, I'm usually not sure about it, but this extension works. Sprayed in polyurea, a plastic rubber widely used on oil rigs, the material was chosen for its low cost and seamless finish. Plus, it's waterproof, won't weather, and is guaranteed for 60 years. But when it comes to natural materials, let's go to the Don, wood. Built in 2019, the grain house is an award-winning timber wraparound extension to a three-bedroom Victorian house. The extension and garden room were designed around the owner's love of natural materials, wood in particular. The exterior cladding is a mixture of natural and charred Siberian larch. Internally, oak, walnut and ash are used together to provide a rich layering of different timber species with pronounced wood grains. And the windows are framed with kiln-dried solid oak and ash-lined recesses. We're also taking our timber inspiration from further afield. British buildings are beautiful, but I also love architecture that's inspired from across the pond. This contemporary extension is based on a traditional wooden conservatory like those found in Midwest America. It's a classic timber frame structure set on a solid base with towering sash windows. 
The owners of this house wanted an energy efficient, unassuming extension to replace an existing conservatory to serve as the main dining area. Two metre tall vertical sash windows mirror the existing French doors and the deep oak fins help create privacy just how we like it. The muted white oiled oak cladding combined with the exposed concrete plinth creates a subtle contrast to the London brick and white painted Edwardian house. To make the most of the modest 100 square foot space, this oak bench spans across the entire wall so that you can experience the garden and not be overlooked. As always, an extension wouldn't be complete without its glass strip separating the old and the new. As long as we're careful the wood is from sustainable stock, then a return into wood as a renewable material is a win-win situation, environmentally and aesthetically. Coming up, Richard's feeling the pressure. I can see it completed. Well, this is looking good, but my family doesn't always have as much faith as I do. When we talk about sustainable building, we often look to energy schemes. Heat and light take up a lot of the airtime. I'm just as interested in materials that will stand the test of time and weather. And some of those are the classics. In North London is an extension which combines some of the classic building choices, visible stills and concrete with other hardy materials utilised in a new way. This house has no bounds when it comes to hard materials and their designs. Who doesn't love a bit of chevron? This extension has it in abundance. It's clad in angled charcoal porcelain tiles and zigzag shaped zinc to mirror the articulated nature of the pitched roof. The architects here wanted to create tension between the extension and the Edwardian house. I don't know about you, but right now I'm feeling a lot of tension. Doorways, windows and stairs are lined with black steel and painted timber. Polished concrete and oak flooring in the living dining areas meet pristine white walls. Copper fixtures pop against the refined pallets. The black steel staircase and balustrade continues around the mezzanine to link the floors together. And if you haven't had enough chevron already, there's more featured in the parquet floor and upstairs and the brass inlaid polished concrete on the ground floor. While this has been given a contemporary twist, the simple colours and materials are a reference to Edwardian design restraints. The interior of this townhouse was a series of dark individual rooms. Now it's opened up to form bright spaces that connect but feel separate. Along with this extension, this double height space creates dramatic volumes that shake up this period property and connect it to the garden. The dining area features this oriel window that protrudes out, creating this perfectly framed view. From a novel approach in traditional materials to a clever use of a classic. There are some costs to the environment in terms of transport, but nothing stands the test of time like marble. Not for the design faint-hearted or the skin. Marble will be here when we're all long gone. These owners have clad their single-storey kitchen extension and garden room in two kinds of perfectly cut Italian stone. Facing each other across the courtyard garden, the lighter arabescato and the dark grey Bardolio marble have been mitered around the doors and windows to create precise 90-degree junctions that wrap themselves seamlessly around the frames. When combined with the robust low-maintenance concrete floor, 
stainless steel kitchen and pewter brick walls, the engineered precision of this beautiful stone gives an unexpected feeling of calm and warmth to this industrial looking space. It's August in South London, and Richard was hoping to have the family home ready by his wife's birthday at the end of July. Safe to say, that hasn't happened. He's beginning to realise that being an architect, project manager and client has its own set of consequences. This is going to be the kitchen. The kitchen's all sitting in boxes over there and um, the kitchen is going to be fitted in the next day or so. I haven't bought that one, the bottle fridge, and I haven't bought this one. I haven't actually bought any of them, to be honest. The problem I've got now, more so than anything else, is more about labour. It's, it's quite stressful trying to get the job done, trying to get builders on site and um, making sure that everyone turns up. Every morning, something else occurs which makes it difficult. Richard's now shifted the completion date back by a month to the beginning of September. That's only three weeks away. 25 years of being an architect, I've never seen anything quite as difficult as this period. It means that my wife's gone on holiday this week with my son. I was supposed to be going, but I didn't. I'm going to be really pleased when Eva comes back from holiday on Saturday or, and she comes in here and the kitchen is fitted. I'll be annoyed if it's not. <laughs> so this is the metallic finish that we're using and it's almost like um, a Cortan steel. The reason we chose this, we wanted it to reflect a lot of the light which comes in from the front. And by having something metallic, it sort of brings, brings it alive. I think it's going to look amazing. I can see it completed. Oh, this is looking good. Mm -hmm. But my family doesn't always have as much faith as I do in projects. This place is going to have life now, hopefully, for another 100 years. That's what I'm hoping, fingers crossed. So it's going to be finished tomorrow? Uh, something, <laughs> something will be finished. Something will be finished. <laughs> We've always been a nation of extenders. The Georgians did it to the Jacobeans. The Victorians did it to the Georgians. And now, we're extending everybody. But whereas our predecessors would have maybe added a wing or a folly or a stone facade, modern taste runs to glass in abundance, everywhere. But given that planning regulations are the bane of every builder's life, how do you get permission to glaze a historical gem? Actually, the rules can be quite surprising. There are loads of examples of how planning has only been given to extend ancient buildings because, rather than mirroring the old style, the new scheme is completely different or changes the use of a building entirely. One of the most breathtakingly audacious additions to an old site is this gin distillery in Hampshire. The existing red brick Victorian buildings at Laverstoke Mill were left derelict until taken over and restored by a massive drinks company. These two fantastical sculptural greenhouses are dedicated to growing tropical plants, botanical ingredients used in creating gin. The building's heated using warm air created during the distilling process. Environmental, striking, with gin at the end. But do remember, always extend responsibly. In Gloucestershire, the owner of Woodchester House wanted to stylistically extend the listed 18th century property with an ultra-modern intervention. This Georgia mansion was virtually untouched until the owner put on a transparent orangery. That's an architectural term for glass. Lots of glass. The 1500 square foot contemporary extension was designed to make the most of the mansion's 30 acres, including an arboretum, 
and some indigenous livestock. The wallaby. Hey, wallabies, don't be scared. It's just me. I've done a runner. This is typical of my life. This huge structure gained planning permission as everything was dictated by the historical site. It's been sunk into the landscape and given an 18-foot tall ceiling height to imitate the original 1746 orangery wall. Apparently, these are the largest glass panels ever imported into the UK. They're triple glazed, and at the touch of a button, they glide open. This is pretty amazing. OK, this is what I could not see happening. OK, this bit was opening as well. I thought, I thought it was going to open out like that, but this makes total sense. What more could you want? The biggest glass doors imported into the UK and wallabies. This is outrageous, man. The sheer expanse of glass helps create the illusion that the concrete ceiling is floating. And the gallery that connects the extension to the house also reaps the rewards of the modern materials. This hallway is covered with a glass roof that sits on glass beams and hooks into the concrete for a slick design. The clever use of dimensions and contemporary architecture helped win a Royal Institute of British Architects Design Award. This house has a structurally complex modern extension and is a classic example of how, again, we find something that's not sympathetic to the original building. Six years ago, architect Richard and writer Eva decided to turn this 19th century workshop and timber yard into an energy-saving passive house. One of the first times this has been done with a commercial to residential conversion in the UK. And I have to say, what they've managed to achieve is magnificent. Hello. Hello. Hey, guys. Richard and Eva, my favourite eco-warriors. How are you guys? We're really well. Really Good to well, see you. Can you. I just say, this looks amazing. You've done it. This is like the passive house of dreams. Aww. I hope so. I love how this is looking. Aww, thank you. Know, you know, it's an industrial building, of course, but I love the strong extensions on it. I love the zinc kind of finishing that you've got. It just really looks solid, robust, very stoic. I love it. That's what it was about, but inside there's a lot of light, and the idea behind it was to bring in a hell of a lot of light because that's really important, you know, yeah. to try and make the space Yeah, and it makes a bigger. Bit, and it makes a bit of a statement when you arrive, um, and I think it's quite welcoming as well. Yeah. So, Richard, you wanted your passive house. Eva, you wanted your forever home. How are you guys feeling? Do you feel like you've achieved that? Yeah, I mean... Yeah. The big thing for us was having the space um, for us as adults and for the young people, for us to get together and also to be separate when we needed to, and I think it's achieved that. It feels great to have a passive house. It's also put, put your money where your mouth is, really. This, this was one of the biggest and hardest challenges I've ever had. To convert an existing building, which is a Victorian building, insulate it so it's it's not harmful to the environment. Yeah. And then try to use as little energy as we possibly can. This ticks all those boxes. You're totally right. And I think what's even more exciting about it is you used an already existing building, you know. So you're even being more sustainable than the average person. Well, you guys are trailblazers, essentially. <laughs> well, you guys are eco-saints. I love it. <laughs> Well, if you ask me, this is an extension for all the right reasons, and it looks so beautiful from the outside. I cannot wait to see all the rest of it. Can we go? Oh, yeah, please. please. Yeah? Yeah, Let's come go on in. inside. It's getting well. cold anyway. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> the walls that once housed the Victorian workshop are now home to a bright and light kitchen and living space. You've done it, guys. This extension is so beautiful. It's so light in here as well. It's lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I, feel, I feel like the extension just opens this whole space out a lot more. For me, it's the light. I really love the way the light travels down from the skylight and kind of envelops the room. Yeah, you've got so much light. Everything's triple glazed. 
And uh, if anything, that was one of the things which was uh, could cause a problem because it might overheat. Yeah. But we we put blinds on all the windows externally, and that actually keeps it cool. Yeah. So the building just stays at a constant temperature. Yeah. Could yeah. I just say, actually, Richard, I'm feeling perfectly between 19 to 21 degrees at the I moment. I think you probably are. It's yeah. probably a little bit warmer downstairs. <laughs> wow, this is nice. <laughs> it's all right. Isn't wow, it? I want to feel like this all the time. This is great. <laughs> I really like this wall covering because even though the effect was to make it feel softer and a little bit warmer, you've got this whole industrial feeling that's going on, which is a real nod to the original structure. Yeah. You've got the beams, you've got this wallpaper effect here, you've got the brick slip, then you've almost got this plastered coloured paint yeah. that is going on. Ah. And it just feels, everything feels quite raw, yeah. but at the same time soft and yeah. cosy. We really wanted uh, to keep the natural feel of the building. Yeah, talk me through this, guys, because I feel like I was a little bit deceived here. <laughs> I thought this was a bit of still going on, but no, what, is this a lacquer or...? Oh, that's a lacquer. Yeah, so the idea with the kitchen is that everything's hidden away, yeah? yeah? So if you want to impress guests or whatever, you can just close all the cupboards. Yeah. And then you've got a hidden that's kitchen. really nice. Yeah, I like that. So everything is compartmentalised and kind of zoned off just to keep everything tidy and neat. That's exactly it. So you've obviously thought about everything. You've left no stone unturned. I love it. It looks beautiful. But what happened to the thousand-pound passive cat flap? <laughs> <laughs> That's... Yeah. Well, we're... where is it? Well, we haven't quite um, got round to putting the cat flap. I have reminded Richard on several occasions. He says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." The cat is going to get its cat flap. But it's when we can afford the cat flap. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> no, no, I mean no, you bought the get... charging station before you bought the cat flap, man. No, no, no. I know where it's going, and it's all it's all geared up to do it. At the moment, we can just open the door and let the cat out. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You're right. There's other methods. Oh, Eva doesn't look too happy about that. The modern industrial design in the kitchen works amazingly, and this successful look continues through to the living room. And look at this space here. Guys, man, this is great. So this is breathable paint, isn't it, that you've used? Yeah, we've used breathable paint throughout the building so that the any moisture that's in the building can come out. And come out. That's really important on this building, isn't it? And just moving forward. Very much so. In new, especially when you're trying to insulate a building a lot to a passive house standard, the last thing you want is condensation, and that's why it's really important. They're not playing around. Although Richard and Eva were given permission to put an extra floor on the roof, because of height restrictions, planning demanded it couldn't have vertical walls. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how the barrel vaulted room has turned out. So right about now, we're in Eva's world. Yeah. So you yes. are, yeah. Loving it, loving the yellow. It's a lot of yellow, though. There's a lot of yellow. Yellow is for creativity. Yeah. Um, and I think we've, <laughs> we've really gone for that. You feel it's a bit too yellow now, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a bit too creative now. Too creative. Jesus. <laughs> I'm too creative. I want to change the colours. That's how creative I am. <laughs> I think when we put the books and when we get a few things in here, I think, you know, we're trying to break uh, it, up it up a little bit. I think it needs a little bit more green, yeah? So yeah. a little bit of the green with the yellow will soften it up a little bit. I, yeah, you know? I think you could be right. The eyeline is really beautiful from here. It's nice to be able to just sit down and just stare at all the roofs. Yeah, and watch the world go by and just, you know, the cats going through the gardens, the trees changing colour. Yeah, it's a bit of a bit of a watchtower. It's definitely given me a cosy feeling being in here. I feel like because of the barrel kind of curved effect, I feel like I'm being hugged somewhat by the room. By putting the ribs onto the roof, it gives it a sort of slightly more embracing feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so you get this sort of Scandinavian sort of look and warmth, and I, I really liked it. It's a special calm place. Richard and Eva began this project to give themselves and their family a home they wouldn't feel guilty living in. As well as creating a space for themselves, they've created a house that is four times more energy efficient than the average new build. That is something to be proud of. So, this has been three years in the making. It's clearly something you've been very passionate about, Richard and Eva. Are you guys feeling passive now? 
I feel like, it, it, yeah, I do feel passive. I'm going to relax as soon as I sort of like can have a glass of wine, sit down in here. I'm going to be really as happy as Larry. Good. And I think hopefully all of us will be, won't we? Yeah. It's been a long road. And the beautiful aspect of it is it is a passive home. And that means it uses so little energy as yes. well. So I feel like with our children, with us, we're all contributing to trying to get to net zero. Yeah. You know, so that's important as well. Yeah. So the original budget was 400,000. Did you go over? Around 10% over, but the house was built for the original budget. Incredible. But I think the greatest expense really was the making sure that all the technical stuff to make this work as a passive house worked. That was a huge technical challenge and that was what really um, probably pushed the budget up quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think it's well worth it. Can I just say congratulations, you guys are a very dynamic couple and hopefully this inspires many others to jump on the bandwagon and do the same, you know, because ultimately so. it's so progressive what you're doing. So I just wanted to say well done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really impressed by what Richard and Eva have achieved. We all need to be thinking about energy consumption and I'm feeling so inspired right now. So you know what? My next project is going to be a passive house. It's the future. It's fair to say I've seen the best of the very best of dynamic living spaces, from the mini to the magnificent. Radical uses of space and colour, innovative materials, subterranean masterpieces, and more. These structures are often works of art in their own right. They take a whole load of physical and emotional investment. Extraordinary. <laughs>